We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. I would like to go to uh, Dana. Dana, what for you is the biggest problem? Why do you think that the results of the Digital Civ Civility Index are worse this year than in previous years? Um, I think because everything now is online, obviously, I think um, we find it now normal that we have a call on Zoom than in person. We find it normal that we chat on on the on any apps that we use and then social apps then in person I think it's gotten worse like Nina already said the anonymous is very um like everyone can do that or everyone can rename themselves to someone else and be rude in like their name uh which is also very very sad and I think it just I think it's just so much worse because everyone thinks now that no one can do um, anything over them but no one can do anything to them because they are on anonymous on internet they think that they can um, be hurt anyone because they're anonymous so I think um, I'm sorry if that didn't make sense but um... that made perfect sense and it's not always easy to speak in front of an audience and we do have a number of people here in our room who are listening to you Diana, I would like to ask you a question. I know that you're with the Council for Digital Good. So what have you been doing about anonymity and accountability? Have you been doing anything in this regard? Or do you have any great ideas on what we could do? Yes, we actually talked about privacy and security and we talked about different ways what can happen to you, like phishing, uh, so so all kind of hate um, and how it can happen, how we can prevent it. And there's a lot of solutions for that. And we actually read a book um, about cyberbullying. Uh, and I think the solution, in my opinion, would be that we spread the awareness, as I said before, um, because people don't actually know it's just a screen and they're like, oh, I told her that I was ugly, but you can't really know and see the reaction of that person who received the message. You, maybe it hurt them, maybe they're becoming depressed because of it. Maybe they feel some pressure. Maybe they don't want to go to school next, next week because they received that because they're ashamed of the way they look. So I think we can't really do anything about it. We can only just come up to the person and teach them what can happen and show them the results of what could happen if we are rude and spread the hate. That makes it difficult, though, because we can't go up to everyone. So I'm wondering, uh, what is the solution or if there is a solution? Another aspect that I see in the Digital Civility Index is privacy. And I know that privacy means something quite different to young people than to oldies like me. Um, Nina, can you tell me what does privacy mean to you? Well, privacy to me means two different things. I say firstly it's the information that I share online then like I would wish this information to stay only within the circle of people that I want to share it with and then secondly I'd also say it's, it's the fact that if we have some sensitive information online and that may be like the information we put there but it also may be that for example like the governments have certain things online about us then I would wish that this data should be protected and it should stay only like within our reach and it shouldn't be accessed by anyone else. Um, protected from who? Who for you is the greatest problem? Who are you trying to protect your information from? Well, I'd say anyone who can abuse it. So people that hack into our accounts, which I, I've noticed happens more and more often lately, 
but it's also just people that we can be even like friends with, but they can then use this information against us in certain situations. And do you agree with her, Diana? What do you think about privacy? Yeah, I definitely agree, but from my from someone who is a really private person, I do actually I think it's more dangerous for um, our information to get spread because of our friends, because I have a lot of trust trust issues. And I think people trust people too much today. So you could literally have a best friend, you tell them something or take a screenshot of something and send it to them. And then one day you're gonna wake up and there's gonna be this screenshot all over the internet. And you're never going to know if it's your best friend if someone doesn't tell you and exposes them. So I think the fact, I think friends are a much bigger problem because there's less of chances of us getting cyber, uh, being a part of a cyber crime because it's a, I don't know if someone would actually come to a young person and do that to someone. I think it's more of a friend to friend problem. Which is a very interesting concept also, because what is a friend today? Uh, would you like to answer that one, Dana? What does it mean uh, to be a friend online? I think if you're not mean, that's a big thing. If you're not spreading hate to that person, to specific person, to um, be nice, honestly, to not to just sometimes I just feel like even if you're just not doing anything on the internet is better than like just um, being hateful or like spreading hate or um, I think it's better um, to just be nice <laughs> to each other. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm wondering if we have anyone else online now uh, who was going to participate. And I think the audience know that there have been big difficulties for people to get online to participate in this session. Is there anyone else who would like to speak and is online and hasn't had the chance yet? Please speak up. No, is Larry Maggard online, who's going to be my co-moderator? Co no. I have a question. I have a question for everyone, and I hope that the audience is also going to answer. Um, that maybe we can pick up a microphone, take it around the room so that people can answer on this one. So why do you think digital civility uh, has become worse this past year? A, the pandemic has created new kind of hate and discord. B, the rise in fake news is having an impact on behavior. C, I don't think things have changed much over the last year or so. And D, I don't know. Now, I would like people to raise their hand and also for the young people online with me so that we can get a little idea. Why has digital civility become worse over this past year? Is it because the pandemic has created a new kind of hate and discord? Can you raise your hand if you think, okay, one person does think this, and what about our young people online? Raise your hand if you think that's the case. No, let's try B. Yes, okay. Ah, okay, B, we have quite a few. The rise in fake news is having an impact on behavior. Can you raise your hand again so I can see the rise in fake news? Okay, so it looks to me like this is the one that we believe. I don't think, C, I don't think things have changed much over the past year. Raise your hand, okay, and D, I don't know. Fine. So this leads us to another question. Fake news. Fake news, I think, became worse with COVID. Everyone can be, be an expert on internet, even if they have no knowledge at all. But what can we do about fake news? Can anyone find 
some ideas on, on how we can act, what we can do, how we can get rid of this fake news, or how we can help everyone see through the fake news. Can I go to Nina for her thoughts on this? Fake news, Nina, what do you think? How can we get rid of it? What can we do? Well, I think that it could potentially, like the situation could potentially be improved by two main things. Firstly, I've noticed that lately social media, for example, Instagram have been putting like warning signs if they like encounter a message or if they encounter a post that isn't true. Like they, they have these like warnings that are like fake information or something like that. So I think that's very useful because then people are more aware when they read it that they shouldn't probably like take it for granted all like just when they read it and maybe like more research is required. So I think that if this would be implemented in more platforms then that would be relatively useful. And um, secondly, also it, I think that it might be good for people to like, for like in general to explain to people that have any, like I think that we've been talking about this quite a lot, but maybe if we would emphasize this even like on social media, that everything that you see online may not be true and that like everything they see on social media especially should be should not be take, uh, taken for granted and that people should like double check whatever they like intend to post especially because that's probably like the biggest way of spreading misinformation and fake fake news because someone think it thinks it's true and then they like post it on their social media so then they like more people see it so i think that if we would take like some precaution steps on people like actually realizing that something might not be true then i think that could help like not eliminate the problem completely, but at least mitigate it to some extent. Okay, so I, I get the feeling what you're saying is check your facts. Now I'm going to do something very unconventional here. I'm going to ask the people in the audience to please come up and take a seat on the stage to pass the microphone between you and to be full participants so that you can also see the young people. Could you come up here, please? I think there are enough seats. I would like you to be part of the debate. Right, and there's a microphone. So, We've been speaking about two things in particular so far, or perhaps three. The first one is privacy. Can we go back and have a little think about privacy? Can you pass the microphone along, please, um, and give me your point of view? Now, we're not just here to talk about the problems. We're here to talk about the solutions. So privacy, what does it mean to you? And what is, what are? the solutions we can use for better privacy on internet? Well, um, does it work? Does it work? Up near your mouth, yes. Okay, uh, I think privacy is like a fundamental right for each and everyone and it has to be protected at all costs because um, it's very important. And I mean, there are certain informations that shouldn't be shared, otherwise we want to. So that's definitely a huge task in the future to protect privacy at all costs. Right. Anyone else like to say a word? Yes. Microphone. Just come and get it, please. I've got too much. There's another one. Oh, there's another Pass one. it along. Okay. Yes. So privacy. What yeah. to do? Uh, so I, I'd like to go back to the question of what privacy is before we go into what to do going forward. Um, I think privacy is essentially a signaling function. It's a question of who can we actually be our true selves in front of? I think if you conceptualize it in those terms, you get a much more holistic understanding of what privacy actually means from an individual action point of view. Um, and so with regards to what we should do going forward, I feel that from a practical point of view for social media platforms, having granular control over who we get to share information with um, is one very important step. But also from the point of view of the legal system, it's also being able to know for sure that we have control over our own data. So we have that power balancing factor 
in the legal system to be able to tell these social media platforms that, yes, I want my data to be done or shared in so-and-so way. I hope that makes sense. It's great. Yes. So I would like to hear maybe from Donna now. Um, here, we heard that, in fact, we have to think about who we can be ourselves in front of. We also heard that there should be much more granularity on social media. We should have much more control over who sees what. Uh, what do you think about this? So I think the most important thing is to also not share everything because people like to overshare these days. Um, even like some people like influencer, influencers and stuff like put their whole life on the internet. And I don't think that's like the safest op option. Um, so I think it would be, um, first of all, great to not overshare everything. Um, and also to, if you do share it, just know to whom you're sharing it with. Like, for example, if you want to post something on Instagram, like do it on close friends to know who sees it. Or if you're posting, just know that they can use this information towards you to bully you, cyber bully you. Um, or like, uh, like Diane already said, they can next morning you can wake up to a picture that you posted dog thought it was cute and you can wake up to it and people could edit it and um, put it towards you for hate. Uh, you keep bringing up bullying. I'm wondering if anyone else would like to speak about privacy or otherwise, I think bullying is sort of the, the elephant in the room and we may go in that direction. Would anyone else like to speak about privacy? Just call it, yes, please go ahead. Thank you so much. I will actually like to um, a bit, you know, make a conversation with uh, Ms. Donna said. I think this is a really intersectional uh, topic because um, for example, I'm representing here the, in the Council of Europe, No Hate Speech Movement Online. And um, this is all about the fundamental human rights that we act in a way we want to uh, where, while we're in our social media channels. And I'm um, sorry, uh, for example, as um, Ms. Donna said, um, there are some people sharing all the information and this is the way they want to share it. And this is quite OK. What we think about is not why you are sharing a lot, but we have to think about how we can make sure it's secure what we share a lot there. So uh, if we talk about why you're sharing a lot, it means that you were, you know, kind of making a uh, person, um, you know, not to allow to use their internet rights, the access to internet and technologies. So uh, that's why we have, this is a quite a, a huge topic that why we're talking about cybersecurity at the same time, the privacy and our human rights at the same time. So this is a huge intersectional topic. Yeah. Yes, very, very important. Um, I was in Morocco just 10 days ago, and it's really unfortunate that we don't have our young people uh, here from Morocco who wanted to join us this morning, but I think that they're having trouble getting into the connection. Um, hate speech is getting worse. We do tend to say anything to anyone and really not think about how that's going to hurt. Uh, in surveys that I've done, 75% of young people say over the past week, uh, sorry, over the past month, that they've actually been mean to somebody else online. Why is it that we do think we can be mean? And why is it that bullying has become such an issue? I'm going to ask these young people online with us, first of all, to speak about bullying, because this is a very important aspect of the Digital Civility uh, Index. And then I'm going to turn to you uh, to get your thoughts about hate speech, being mean online, because for me, a lot of that can lead to bullying. Uh, Nina, would you like to share your thoughts on bullying with us? Well, I think that the main reason why this occurs so much online, especially, is because people don't realize what kind of consequences their actions online may have. 
And that may be like for a couple of reasons. Like firstly, they might just like simply say something that they don't mean offensively, but the people, because like you don't get to hear the toy, the tone or like in what you don't like often get the context behind why someone said something about you. So that may really like hurt you because it may not be meant like in a bad way, but it is meant in a bad way. I mean, like then you take it in a bad way, which may not be good. But also, as well as that, just simply people being mean to each other online because they don't think it has such an impact because it's just online. However, like, of course, it hurts people in reality as well. And uh, what about Diana? Any thoughts or any solutions? Because I think we've been going around in circles for the past 20 years on many of these issues. This morning, I would like to come out with a few solutions. Yes, Diana. Yeah, I would also like, uh, I would also like to go back to privacy. Um, one, of, uh, one of you said that about privacy that you have to know around who can you be yourself. That's what I was actually thinking about. Um, that's the problem of community, uh, communicating through social media. You, on the chat, you get, a different perspective and different expectations about someone and then when you meet them online for um in real life for example they can be a whole different person because through chat you can't see um their facial expressions their reactions to what you say maybe you said something funny in an appropriate way but they and they just sent you like a laughing emoji and ha 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 you're funny but in reality when you say something like that they're just gonna be like oh yeah i don't like that so that i think that's the problem because you can't see or hear someone see what they do, how they react. So that's what I wanted to say. And about how to prevent that, I'd say um, that's what they do in my country. They teach us in school in like sixth or fifth grade. There comes like a, a person from a council for like di digital security and everything and tells us and shows us the consequences, what could happen. So in my country, for example, we don't experience a lot of cyberbullying and stuff. This usually just, you know, in real life, which is also a problem. Um, and I would think it's because they actually make sure of that in schools. Okay. So you think the school has a big role to play and that schools can actually do something about this. Um, I think it was Dana that I didn't just speak to. Dana, tell us about bullying, solutions, being mean, anything that you want. Yeah, I think like um, Diana said, it's a really big thing if even as parents maybe to come to your children and tell them um, when they get a phone or anything when to start using social media how to use it, um, who to chat with, who not to chat with, what to see, like any links, if you get any strange, weird stuff. Like, I feel like it's important that, like Diana said, schools should really um, chat about with young people um, about safety and stuff and cyberbullying. And even there's a, obviously like a lot of bullying happening at schools, um, not much on the internet in my country, like Diana said. Um, so, um, I think, I think Diana really got the point. So um, I think that's it for me. <laughs> and do you think that the schools are doing enough? And here I'm going to turn to uh, the audience. Are schools doing enough about this? Or what else can we do so that we learn to behave much better online, so that we learn to be digitally civil? Who would like to intervene? No one. I'm sure you've got ideas. Come on, pass the microphone along. Yes. Okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Firstly, I would like to say that it's absolutely fantastic to start uh, IGF with uh, this uh, young people discussion who are the present and the future of the internet. So it's really so, so nice. Uh, I think that generally speaking, uh, schools must work on relations and must work on those golden values. Because as we can see, uh, the virtual life is not virtual anymore. Like it's our normal, regular social life. And when you speak to, 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 to children, when we speak to young people, they say that they see some different direction of, this, of the phenomenon of bullying. Because firstly, we've been talking that people 
uh, face to face behave better than online. But now they say that that somehow those bullying um, activities move from the internet also to real life. Like people are more open to give negative comments even face to face. So we learned somehow to be so true. So, you know, in our reactions, so open that we start not to also appreciate people offline when we meet someone. But also I think children look at um, adults and they learn how to ridiculize opinions, how to really have a, um, a very bad way of having those um, adult people discussions. So I think it's a, it's a huge problem and the school should focus on relations between people, on talking about how to um, respect uh, each other and uh, how, to, um, how to understand that the, the virtual life is the same life that we live off offline. Thank you very much, Anya, and thank you so much for coming in. I'm seeing comments uh, on the chat, and I would love to say them, but I'm afraid my glasses got lost in my baggage and I can't read the chat. Uh, would one of the moderators up there uh, read any interesting chats that come up? Is that possible? Okay, okay, thank you. So, so yes, uh, please. Please, do. I have a last comment. You know, while we're all talking about gender equality, we say, um, people say actually protect, uh, don't protect your daughter, but uh, educate your son. It's actually all about the same topic we are talking about here: limit in person to, for sharing and you know connecting people and uh, trying to do whatever they want to online uh, instead of educating others not to bull or you know crush the processes that they do. So that's why I think this is really all about education that we have to deliver for young people in schools and kindergartens because there is no any curriculum regarding um, bullying, regarding privacy, regarding internet um, in, in uh, ed schools, only universities and masters and such, but it's not really uh, enough for that because bullying process is uh, especially happening for the young people and the teenagers. And that's why it's really important that we do this in a schools, high school and education system. So that's why the main solution would be making a proper and relevant information and curriculum in education in high schools and even primary schools, I think, because right now uh, we're more likely talking about digital natives, which is more like uh, more likely uh, children that using the internet so much uh, in last um, century, you know. So that's why it's really important to make sure education provides this information. So, yeah. Thank you. And it's really interesting to hear because no hate speech, I know, has been running for at least 10 years and really pushing young people to think about what they're saying. I believe now that we actually have Jim into the session. Uh, good morning, Jim. Are you there with us? And perhaps you can take on a little of the moderating. I am here. Can you can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Excellent. Um, yes. So uh, I am in the chat room. Unfortunately, um, we've been uh, bit by the technical gremlins yet again. So lots of folks are struggling to get in. Um, took me 25 minutes. Right now, there's nothing in the chat uh, as far as questions are concerned. So um, when, when something does come up and if folks uh, who are participating online do have questions, they can either drop them into the uh, chat box or they can raise your hand in the Zoom function and uh, hopefully we can recognize you and uh, give you the microphone. Thank you. So talking about bullying, um, many young people say what concerns them the most is not to know how to intervene when a friend of theirs is being bullied. And that, in fact, it hurts much more than when you're bullied yourself, which is a question of resilience. And we'll get back to that shortly. Um, do you think this is an issue? And how can we teach people what to do when their friends are being bullied? I'd like to turn back to my panelists now. Um, Nina, does it concern you more when your friends are being bullied and you don't know how to intervene? or do you think that's not really relevant for you? 
Well, I must say that I agree with the fact that it does concern me more when my friends get bullied or when someone mistreats them online than if that would have happened to me. Because I think that's also like the reason for that is because I'm part of the digital council that Microsoft organizes. So I think that I'm exposed to more ways and like in general to, to like a discussion about it. Whereas I think that the majority of my friends do not really know how to cope with cyberbullying online. So, so I think that definitely the fact that like I would probably know how to cope with it online, whereas my friends wouldn't, would mean that I would feel relatively like, hopeless. And I would also like, wouldn't probably, like, I don't think I would know how to like help them specifically because if they wouldn't want help because, well, each situation like and each thing, like each time something like cyberbullying occurs, like it's really individual, so. Um, yeah, I would feel worse if, if it would happen to my friends because I wouldn't like, especially if I wouldn't know how to help them, that would feel really bad because then I would feel like I failed as a friend to an extent. Um, thank you very much. And Dana, what do you think about that? Um, yes, I think I would feel worse for my friends. Luckily, I have not experienced that. Um, neither have I known that my friends did. Uh, but I think the I would... Um, send them to read the book that we re read it was it was words wound and we also had the discussion about that book and it was uh, has a lot of um, experiences that people had about cyberbullying uh, being cyberbullied and them doing the cyberbullying um, so and it has a lot of so, uh, great ways uh, to prevent it to some solutions and it's a great book so I think I would just recommend them to read it if I I would obviously try to help them, but if they wouldn't understand, I would just hand them the book. Thank you. And uh, it's Diana, isn't it? Um, the next, uh, or is it Dana? Who did I just speak to? I just spoke to Diana. So no. now I'd like to hear from Dana. No, I, you just spoke to me. I'm Dana. Oh, okay. <laughs> Diana, please. Yes. Um, actually, um, I don't know how, if this would even happen to my friends, because me and my friends were very careless and we don't really care about others opinion and we're actually not our life lives don't depend on social media but if this would happen um i would of course be more concerned for my friends if it would happen to them than for myself because i know how i would act but i don't know how would they act because i can't read their minds so i you know help them with my knowledge that i got from cdg europe um and that i'd probably do that but i don't think that would ever happen oh lucky you so cdg we keep hearing about the council for digital good and this is very interesting because you young people you feel that you know how to handle these situations because you're part of a group and i'm sure i know no hate speech is another group but isn't it the role of the family to be teaching this? What happens if you can't be part of a group? And if it's the role of the family, uh, what age should we start learning in our family to be kind to each other, the importance of respect? What age do you think it's important to be learning about empathy online? Uh, Nina? Well, um... To the thing you said about family, I think that to an extent, of course, it's the family's role to prepare you for life. However, I don't really think we should expect the parents to like properly explain this to children because of course our parents weren't the people who grew up in this environment. Because like we were those that like grow up with this and are like exposed to online content like ever since our like young childhood, but our parents weren't. So I think that we should more like keep this role to the school that can actually like invite experts that like know how to give advice. Whereas like our parents should be those that like should advise us with things that they understand. Great, so you're saying wait till you get to school. Um, Diana, what age should we start learning about empathy and perhaps where should we be learning about it? Um, actually, I would um, comment about what uh, Nina said. I would actually blame my parents for, um, not just my parents, most of the parenthood and the upbringing for Generation Z 
was that was wrong the because when a child start started crying they didn't you know snuggle them cuddle them they just gave them, was an ipad and they were like shut up so i blame that because um blame my parents and the upbringing because that's absolutely wrong um but i also agree that it's now the, the parents is um they have to it's there they have to teach us and tell us why they did that and what 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 should we do and how would we act in different situations but of course us when we become teenagers we don't really listen to our parents which is also a big problem because of puberty so i think schools against schools i just think it's schools have to do that it's they have to do that not the parents because i don't think we would really listen to them i that's okay. because i don't really listen to my parents so <laughs> i bet you did when you were very young though uh, diana you just spoke to diana I, now you're gonna speak sorry. to diana <laughs> you've got to put me right donna Yes, so I agree with both of them. I think the schools, I think it's the responsibility of the school. And even maybe um, at the end of kindergarten or just start like slowly knowing what um, to be nice and to not um, bully and stuff. And I think pa parents obviously know some stuff, but they don't know as much as some uh, who is their job to tell people and help them with this kind of stuff. So I think parents definitely have a role in that, but not as much as um, the people that actually um, has is, is their job to explain that to people, so. Thank you. And I'm wondering, what do you think? At what age and where should we be learning about empathy? Yes, you've got the microphone. Yeah, I'd uh, love to add something to this. Um, so first of all, thank you um, all for sharing those interesting perspectives. Uh, I myself, I think um, my teenage years are maybe like, uh, well, I'm, I guess I'm like 10 years older than you guys. Um, and what I experienced was like when Facebook uh, just came up, uh, my parents always told me, well, don't put anything on there. It's going to stay in the internet forever. Um, and they didn't have a clue about social media. And I think it's critical that we all learn about the internet and about digital civility and empathy online, and that we never stop doing this and that we don't stop at any age because right now there's also older people, older generations who have to learn about it, who have to engage with the um, things that their children are doing there, that their grandchildren are doing online. Um, so I actually, to answer your question, um, I think we should teach uh, everyone at every age um, to also facilitate teaching in families and in schools. Yes. Would you like to pass it along? Are there any other ideas? Empathy, what age? How do we learn it? I guess we learned it uh, the whole life, our whole life. We should uh, learn some kind of empathy, how to share experience with others, how to meet uh, also in real uh, uh, in real life every day and uh, I also share this experience of millennial generation so uh, I guess uh, with internet grew with me uh, the, the application and all sorts of um, social media and uh, now Gen Z are all born mm -hmm. to this uh, so it's already uh, evolved and uh, I wonder how is your perspective and I think the um generations should uh, generations should uh, talk about what's what's their experience and then we can understand each other better yeah and that's how we grew empathy <laughs> and uh, interesting question but how do we share these experiences where do we share them because so far we don't seem to have that right solution when <laughs> when? when where <laughs> how yeah um, this kind of conference, of course, is <laughs> some, uh, some, uh, somehow a solution. Uh, now we can uh, share our uh, ideas and uh, thoughts about how wor the world works right now. And um, I guess, I, for, for example, I have a, a younger sister, so I learned from her uh, the games she plays and 
and uh, <laughs> new words she used uh, online and uh, um, she she teaches me about stuff that I don't know I teach her about stuff she doesn't know about so I guess it's all about uh, dialogue generation dialogue that's a very, very important concept, dialogue. I see that at long last we have our co-moderator online. Good morning, Larry. Sorry that you've had so much trouble coming in. Would you like to say a few words and perhaps ask a few questions? He's on mute, unfortunately. We don't- Larry, you're muted. Sorry, that I can fix. I said, I thank you very much. I, I am at a bit, bit of a disadvantage because I don't know what we've been discussing so far. Uh, sorry about the technical glitch that apparently is affecting a lot of people. Uh, and thank to Una for allowing me to use it, come in on her account. Um, the, what, the question that I'm curious about is what's going on right now with digital civility? Perhaps you've discussed this, but the fact that we've seen a downtick in 2021 obviously is concerning. Uh, and there is some presumption that it has to do with COVID. Uh, perhaps that's the case, perhaps there's other issues. So uh, if you haven't already discussed it, I think it'd be very interesting to talk a little bit about what's happening right now in the world that seems to be affecting digital civility. Actually, and it's a pity that you weren't able to be with us, Larry, earlier. I think that we have discussed Good. that, what's going on right now. And I think we, we've come to the conclusion that one, uh, well, it was very interesting what one of our young people said, that in fact, kids are growing up with the tablet, uh, they're not, dialogue is key. Uh, another thing we've talked about is fake news. We've also talked about bullying and about empathy. We've talked about privacy this morning. Um, so we, we've covered quite a few issues, but I believe you were going to give us a bit more background also on uh, the Digital Civility Index. Yes, Would you like said, to tell us a bit more, Larry, please? Sure. Well, as, as you know, Janice, and maybe others do too, Microsoft have been doing this research for a number of years. And uh, what they said, and this is what preempted, what prompted my initial question, is that 82% of the 23 countries that they surveyed said that online civility was net worth. I think an exception was Colombia. They're, they're having a better experience there. But in general, uh, and I, I'm not going to go through the, the details of the survey because it's, it's kind of technical. And, uh, but in general, we're seeing a, uh, a deterioration. And I think that that's really the, the top line of this survey. Uh, the fact that uh, negative outcomes are primarily what we're seeing. We've seen a couple of exceptions, uh, apparently false and misleading information. They've seen a bit of an improvement. So that's good news, but in general, bad news. And I think it leads to the broader question of, you know, what is going on in the world and really from young people's perspective, how can we turn this around? And I say we, because all of us uh, stakeholders, my our older folks included have a, have a interest in, seeing this turnaround. And Janice, you and I have been around long enough to see trends go up and down. We've seen, we've seen crises averted. We've seen, for example, many cities have cleaner air now than they had when I was a child. Uh, so it's not as if just because we're having a downtick and we've had a la bad couple of years that we have to you know, hang our heads and think that the future is bleak. So I guess what I would wanna know, and again, I apologize that this has been talked about, but we have young people on the line. What, is, what are they going to do? What are we collectively, but led by young people going to do to turn this around and, and really deal with, with the crisis that we're dealing with misinformation, hostility, anger, uh, resentment, all of the things that, that are plaguing uh, much of society these days? Thank you so much, Larry. And we're going to get onto that question, but I see at long last, our youth from Malaysia has managed to get in. Good morning, Arif Azam. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and perhaps answer Larry's question first? 
Hi, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Muhammad Arif Azam. I am from Malaysia. I am 20 years old and I am st currently studying law in Malaysia. So answering Larry's question previously, I would say that there's nothing much that we can do. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can't do as a young as a youth, but the thing is that we do not know where to start. So I think this is of imperative to somehow to um, um, to let um, our curriculum, um, for example, like our syllabus of education to instill what is actually digital civility because most of people know how to use internet or like to, 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 to utilize such technologies. But when it comes to being civilized in cyberspace, what we can do, some people just are just being mean in general, right? So as a youth, we know how to utilize those technologies, but what we can do, we do not know where to start. So this is very important. Educational, um, in just education institution plays a vital role in somehow implementing digital civility because I feel like most of the time people are not aware of such idea, right? So I think we as a youth, we know we do not know what to do, but we can do something. So as a youth, there's nothing much that we can do as of now because we are not already taught, we are not taught about this. But the least that we can do is just being civilized in, um, in cyberspace and just being more aware of technologies so we can be more digitally um, literate about something. So I think that's my point of view. Well, thank you so much. You're throwing it back onto our shoulders. You can do it. But first of all, uh, people need to tell you what to do and give you the tools. And perhaps that leads to a very interesting thing. I read the other day that resilience, you can sum it up with five C's. Resilience is the competences and empathy is one of those competences. Resilience is also the control of the tools and knowing how to use, for example, the settings on social media. But it's also the connections, having someone that you can share with and where you can get help whenever you need it. There are probably a lot of other things. You're talking about education, which is alongside competencies. So I wonder what other solutions we've got. Can Nina offer us a solution to Larry's question? Well, of course, as was previously discussed, I think education is a big part of it. But I also think that um, informing the youth online because as well could help like for example like paid Instagram posts just like reminding people to be polite and to think about the actions and the consequences that um, well their actions have online could also help because it could help to remind the youth that may have already even been educated about it to like behave with respect online. May, may I ask a, a related question uh, about youth activism? I actually come from when I was your age, and I know that sounds funny to say that, but uh, it was right in the middle of the Vietnam War. And, and young people around the world, I think, were largely responsible for convincing the United States and other countries to change a policy. And we, you know, we, we ended a, a war that seemed like it would never end. I have never given up that optimism that I had at that point of having been part of that movement. And I'm wondering how that translates to the crises of today, whether it's the environment, the climate challenge. And, and the reason I say this is because digital civility is not simply just behaving yourself, being nice people. It's great to be nice people, but it also means involve people, taking those passions, uh, channeling anger to where it really belongs, which is whether it's oppression or misogyny or racism or uh, climate crises, uh, authoritarianism, how can the voices of young people be mobilized to really focus on some of those pressing world problems, which I think, frankly, if you were universally mobilized, that might help some of the situations that we're talking about today. Donna, do you have a solution? I actually don't really um, know how to answer this question. So um, I would just say to, 
I, I honestly, I don't know. So if anyone else could ask. Do you feel that you actively participate? Are there any things that are really, really important to you and where you make sure that your voice is heard? Um, I, um, if we go back to like what we were saying like about um, education and stuff like that, I think it's really important and also privacy, everything that we told before is really important to uh, today's um, digital facility and stuff. So I think, yeah. But what's one thing that you have done to share your ideas and to push other people to act? Can you think of one thing that you've done so far, perhaps as a member of the Council for Digital Good, where you've shared an idea and you've pushed people around you to act. Is there any example you can give me? Um, maybe even for, for the council that we do, we sometimes do presentations to represent any sort of topics. And I think um, maybe even to, um, as schools, I've definitely um, told even my friends how to, act um, everywhere on social media and um, internet on as the big like in, on internet at all so that's great so you're active and this is really uh, digital civility teaching others participating um, what about Diana yeah um, actually I have um my schoolmate uh, actually has made like an organization first it was just only an instagram profile when they were spreading awareness of what was happening in my country because teenagers my age don't really know what the government is doing in our country and how how much power it actually holds um so uh and now it's a whole organization and basically they organize protests um against the government and uh i think that's a really good example uh of how if how much power the youth has if we connect if we spread the awareness the fact that we already have internet and the fact that we can spread something so fast by just clicking a few buttons and already so many people can see it i think that is like like a pro about the internet these days thank you thank you Janice, yes it's it's jim uh if i could just interrupt um uh, Felicia has also joined us, but she shows up as Jennifer Chung. So uh, we may want to bring Felicia into the conversation here as well. Yes, please, Felicia. And I believe that Aya has also joined us. Felicia, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and give us an example of where you are really active and trying to change the world and make it a better place? Um, hi, I'm Felicia. Uh, I'm from Indonesia and I'm actually a social science student. My background is uh, business law, but I currently study international law. So um, speaking of digital civility, I would say that um, I'm not sure if some of you has brought up the idea of mental resilience. So I think it's quite important to bring up uh, the idea of mental resilience, uh, what does that mean? Uh, I would say that uh, in simple words, mental resilience is about how we don't get easily triggered by uh, people saying, especially on the social media. Because as far as uh, I'm ob ob I observe, I'll say I'm an introvert type when it comes to uh, using social media, uh, I would say that there are some, some young people who get is a trigger uh, when reading offensive comments. However, um, I would say that um, in the digital space, everyone, everyone is equal as in if they have this uh, difficulty, such as uh, as of today, people, people have this opportunity to open up uh, their, their own mental health issue, I would say. And they just, you know, they just spread this awareness, like you already say that uh, spreading awareness is quite important. So I would say that um, digital space is quite important that uh, give people equal opportunity to share their point of view. So, yeah. 
Thank you. And yes, we started speaking about resilience because I agree it's really important. I believe now that we have the young person from Iceland, Aya. Aya, would you like to come in and give us your ideas and tell us a little bit about what you have been doing? Because I know you've been very active in trying to make internet a better place, a more civil place. Yes, hi, I'm Aya. Um, I think that what I've done is that I live by the golden rule always. And I think um, when somebody does it, that other people will try to imitate that behavior. And so we really need um, try and find the right words. <laughs> Role models, perhaps? Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but I have been very active in making prevention videos and such. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. What, what are some of the focuses on your prevention video? What do you, what do you, what do you actually say in the videos? Um, we are working right now on um, a video about how parents and um, how they can, how they should act because um, they are the children's um, role mod models. So that um, the children always try to imitate their parents because they look, look up to them. So, um, I think that children and teenagers often get, I think, a um, bad reputation, um, but it really starts with how the parents and the people around them, the community is acting. So, yeah. It sounds like you're the role model for the parents, which is perhaps <laughs> very appropriate. <laughs> um, Thank you. I'm wondering if we have uh, Shemai or Malak from Morocco with us. Have either managed to get in? Janice, unless they are coming in under somebody else's name, I don't believe they have joined us. Okay, they could have come in under the name of Lucy or Youssef. No. I don't see them in. Uh, I would like to speak put the microphone around the room for a little moment and tell us how you are actively trying to promote digital civ civility. You have the microphone there. Would you like to start from your end, pass it around so that we all just have a word or two about what we're being uh, doing to be active citizens to make the internet more civil? One. Okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that's really important for me, as I said before, education. And I'm as a young person, I work more likely not formal education, but non-formal education system. And I believe that training courses and studies uh, for young people and, um, you know, explain and deliver them concrete competences and skills regarding the internet and hate speech, especially uh, the one that we said empathy, I would rather say mutual respect uh for human rights i think this is really important and uh, yeah what i do actually as a young person is trying to um also as a facilitator trying to uh um facilitate the processes in the training courses regarding the um, uh, non-formal education and mutual respect through that yeah this is i think the one that we can achieve it yeah if i can ask a follow-up question um when you talk about education i i certainly understand that but there are people who, for whom it's not a matter of ignorance, but a matter of policy that they are trying to make things bad. I mean, how do you educate somebody who is going out of their way to spread misinformation or to create hate speech? Um, and, I, and I say that respectfully, because if I knew the answer to that, I'd be happy to share it myself. It's a difficult question, but I'd love to get your perspective on how you push back for people who may be very well educated, but are choosing to, to behave uh, uncivilly? Well, that's a huge question. And this is the what actually we're talking about mutual respect. Uh, well, I wouldn't talk about the whole um, education system, but exactly what we are doing with the non-formal education system. 
So in our medication system, uh, only those people are trying to join and those people uh, have access who already want to learn about this. And we invite only those people who are not uh, coming there to uh, crash the prices and put their own opinions on it, but also pr trying to give them access and you know um, pr provide them the f free and safe space to discuss their own feelings and the solution that they can put on. Um, so this is uh, what we believe non from education system actually provides us, but not really the whole education system around the world. So uh, unfortunately, I'm not really sure if uh, the, the your question can be covered with the non from education system. So I think it's quite different, right? Um, well, I admittedly so. asked you a very difficult question, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, if I could just quickly follow up on that, because that was a very interesting uh, line of inquiry. Um, I, I think, and this, is, this goes back to the question that was asked uh, when we were actually members of the audience, uh, which was like, it, there's this perception that things have gotten a lot worse in terms of hate speech, cyberbullying, and so on. Um, so what are the reasons for it? And I was the only one in the crowd who raised my hand and said, like, things haven't changed. Things have always been this way because human beings are naturally very pessimistic. And if you actually look at the hate speech that is being spewed, it's not always by young people. It's also by older people who have gotten access to things like Facebook. And this has been very much proven during the latest American elections. Um, we've seen so much misinformation and hate speech being spread, not only by young individuals, but I would argue more so by people from older generations who are using this technology. And so <laughs> I don't want to sound so pessimistic to the point of nihilism or just like oh this is well this is all that there is to it we can't really do anything about it because i want to draw it back to the point on youth activism and what is it that we're doing um i think there are two things one is obviously the youth activism side of things but the other point is a technical control mechanism that could exist um which interplays very I think very much so with the mental resilience side of things. And I'll explain that in a second. Um, in terms of youth activism, what it is that we're doing, I, I feel like just actively calling people out and saying, listen, this is not okay, is something that is very, very powerful. Because a lot of the time, the reason why I think hate speech and cyberbullying happen quite a lot is because the virtual world because you can't see the consequences of your actions, which is what some of our other panels have spoken about, it tends to dehumanize the individual. This is, an, this is a war tactic as well as a propaganda tactic. The only way that you can be comfortable in doing something this bad is if you look at the opponent or look at the other person and don't consider them human anymore. And that I think is one of the biggest issues. And so the more that people call out and say, no, this is actually bad, there are consequences to this. That's one of the ways that I feel uh, I personally do, and I think more people should get involved with. The second, and I'll, I'll end this very quickly because I realize I'm taking quite a lot of time, but the technical control measures and resilience, there's a block button on every single platform. R learning how to use the block button and learning how to use things like mute on Twitter or avoid topics on things like Instagram and, and TikTok are technical control measures that have been implemented that we need to have the mental resilience to be able to use. It's just because we feel like we want to be part of something that we're not necessarily being accepted in, we feel like we need to get constantly exposed to this. So having the mental resilience to actually think and say like, okay, I don't need this in my life. I should probably block this or take it out. I think that's another very important way of countering a lot of the cyberbullying, um, you know, hate speech issues that exist. That's just I my quick two cents. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I just want to quickly follow up on your initial comment about pessimism. While it is true that we have a short term issue where there has actually been a deterioration in civility, the long term data, if you look back over the last 25 years, has all been very positive in terms of many aspects of civility, uh, crimes against children, uh, behavior, alcoholism, unwanted pregnancy, almost all of the uh, things that we, we worry about have actually gotten better long-term over the last 25 years. Again, there may be a, a temporary dip. Yet at the same time, as I say that, if you had asked somebody three, four, five years ago, the average person would have said, oh, it's getting worse. So you're absolutely right. There is a sort of a perpetual pessimism even when the data happens to be positive. Well, right now, admittedly, there is some negative data, but generally speaking, um, we do need to remind people that young people especially uh, have done 
have been pretty remarkable in many ways overall in adapting to the technology and, and using it in positive ways. Uh, Larry, I think that two of our young people want to come in and have their word on this. Um, I saw that Diana had her hand up. Diana, did you want to add something here? Yeah, I wanted to answer to Larry uh, and answer to Larry's question. So, how would you actually um, prevent someone from bullying someone? I'd come up to the person and ask them, "What if this was your sister? What if someone was doing this to your sister or your brother?" There was like this thing uh, where people were talking ab about abortion and then some guy was like oh I think abortion shouldn't you know be legal and thing and then a girl came up to him and she was like what if it was your girlfriend or your sister what would you do would would you think abortion would still should be illegal so I think that's that's how I should do it and prevent it okay. thanks and Arif Azam also had something to add I saw yeah. his hand up. Hi, um, I am actually trying to respond to previous um, speaker. So he said that it's very good for you to use that control mechanism where you can just block and use that kind of button effectively, right? But the thing is that we have to understand that it's more on the individual aspect where we can defend ourselves from being uncivilized because we want to defend ourselves from being affected by such negative comments. But how about these kind of people who such who did such um hatred speech right so i think it's like not really it's effective to ourselves because we know how to refrain ourselves from being affected by such negative comments but how about those people are they going to somehow um being punished for being mean on 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 social media or like on internet because at the end of the day we are not the one to win such hatred speech right they are the one so um it's, it's more like it's, it's like a double-edged sword where we can see that there are pros and cons between um, such um, method and tool. So, and then another thing is that um, I think like digital civility is not just about empathy, but it's more than just about that. It's such as like how the internet works, understanding user's data, and then practicing digital literacy. So in order to attain digital civility, I feel like these are the key concepts that we need to dissect and also need to um, take into account because most of the time people think like oh we just being like Larry said before digital is not just about being empathy it's not it's more than that and this is the reason why I think that the key concept of digital civility must be um, somehow elucidated on what we want to achieve because at the end of the day we do not have like a clear um answer a uh, uh, clear definition of what the digitivity is because at the end of the day we only think that digitivity is all about big empathy so i think that's all for me thank you and felicia you have your hand up so uh anyway i like to add what uh she just said that uh i truly agree on on his point of view uh so i would say that um, when it comes to when facing this this issue or this uh, some cyber crime on the internet, I would say that um, blocking mechanism is not is not an effective way to tackle this issue. So we need to uh, what I'm trying to point out is that we need to stand up for some kind of uh, accountability or responsibility. Uh, well, for for example, we can we can um, bring this issue to to some kind of institutions, uh, for example, like legal legal enforcement, which can help us to tackle and and go against this perpetrator because when when we try to block this uh, uh, this criminal or perpetrator's account, they can use the other account to do the same things. So I will say that uh, blocking mechanism is not is not an efficient way to to merely tackle this uh, this crime. Or, or hate speech, like you said before. Um, I think that you've brought us to a second question, uh, which we'd plan to do on a poll, but I don't think we can. I would like you to raise your hand if you, when you hear the answer that you think is correct. So why do young people rate the level of digital civility higher than adults? Is it because young people more easily accept posts and comments that adults 
find mean and don't find funny? Is it because young people don't fully understand the term digital civility? Is it because young people aren't really bothered about things like online reputation or I don't know. So who would answer the first? Um, young people rate digital civility higher than adults because they more easily accept posts and comments that adults find mean and not funny. Would you agree with that? Yes? Yes, so we've got a couple who agree with that. And online, oh yes, three, oh, three of our young people online. Uh, the next one, young people don't fully understand the term digital civility. Raise your hand if you think this is the case and you can have one, more than one answer. Now that is interesting. Young people do believe that they understand the term digital civility. And thirdly, young people really aren't bothered about things like online reputation. We have one hand raised online, two, but no other hands raised. I would like to move the microphone now. Janice, can I ask one more question? Yes, please go can ahead, I Larry. Could it be that young people are more resilient than adults give them credit for? <laughs> Who would agree with that? Yes. <laughs> Looks like you really hit the case there. Okay, young people are more resilient than what we expect because all the young people online have got their hand up. I'd like to move around the room because I did make these people come up to the front. Um, uh, your thoughts on this. Do you have a microphone? Anya has the microphone. You start, Anya. Yes, I think it's um, it's something very smart to say that young people are more resilient, but I think the young people are more resilient the more their environment is supportive. That's why I think it's very, very crucial to educate parents and educators, not only to share awareness between young people because they know a lot, but because when something bad happens, the reaction of parents and the reaction of, of teachers is absolutely crucial because they can also influence the other peers, how they will react if something bad happens, for example, a serious cyberbullying. And we see from our research that we do in Poland that many cases, like for example, related to uh, sexting cases, when someone um, put their, uh, their naked uh, photos online, the future of the kid who does it really depends on the on the adults how they would react how they would support so i think young people generally are resilient but not that resilient if uh, if the, the adult world will uh, step behind thanks Anya. would anyone else would you like to have a word to say i guess uh, the thing that anna said is very important the support of adults and uh, and uh, we, we have to, as aware, develop human, uh, because till we are 25, our rational thinking is still developing. Uh, we should support the younger generations in their um, internet uh, uh, experience and journey. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Did you have a word to say there? Well, I... Um try to reflect about it in like in my personal experience um and that might uh sound a bit negative but i feel like the young generations that have actually grown up um on social media with the internet uh might have also just been exposed to so many things that they um i don't know the english term but have gotten used to a certain level um of bad bad stuff um not yeah not not only hate, but also uh, similar topics. So it also might be the case to a certain extent that they're just used to to these levels um, and they have learned to deal with it. I don't know how and what extent to what extent that's part of resilience as well. Maybe you uh, have some points on that, but it's not a not a good thing to say, um, but I'm afraid that's part of the story too. So the sensitivity has dropped. And would you like to have a last word? Yes, 
what are your thoughts on it? Do you have any thoughts on it? Did you want to add anything? Uh, I don't want to add anything, but I totally agree with like the one, um, like what was said. There's before. someone. Yes, come and get a microphone, please. Someone in the public, and then I'm going to hand it over to you, Larry, to do the last uh, eight minutes with our young people because we must stop right on the dot of eleven o'clock. Yes, hello. Um, I'm, I'm a, a member of a network called I Am Here, hashtag I Am Here. And what we do is that we go online and we uh, uh, counter hate speech and misinformation by posting comments. We try to be respectful, we try to be benevolent. And uh, so now we are in 18 countries in the world, uh, we have uh, 150,000 people. Uh, so we think community can play a role, you know, like being together, uh, um, supporting each other, protecting each other. And, and, you know, this is a key element of resilience and safety. So this is what we do. We think uh, also young people could, could you know, uh, maybe uh, be uh, inspired by that, by the fact that uh, as a community, we are stronger and, and we can really ma make a change. Thank you. And it's great to have the audience participating like this. Over to you, Larry, for the last eight minutes, please. Yeah. And perhaps Aya wanted to add something or she's hardly had anything to say. Did, okay. Well, I mean, in general, what, what I, first of all, I want to say this has been a really great discussion. And, you know, as somebody who's been involved in internet safety now since, believe it or not, 1994, that's long before most of you were born. Janice also has been around that long. I am very excited to hear the conversations here because we've elevated the conversation tremendously over what many have been talking about over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, but I am particularly interested in, in, at right now as to how those of us who really have a sense that we need to be fighting hate speech. We need to be fighting misinformation. We need to be encouraging civility. We need to be fighting bullying. What we can do, because almost anything that I could say, and I could, like anybody else in this room, give you a speech as to all the things that we should do, but almost everything I could say is going to have a potential unintended negative consequence. So, for example, uh, it's already been talked about by, by one of our participants that we should push back. And I have done that, but sometimes when you push back, you actually wind up creating more anger and you just, the, the term is feed the trolls, um, you know, that you should correct misinformation, but sometimes when you correct information by giving credible sources, like, okay, here's an article in the Guardian or the New York Times or whatever, they'll just say, well, see, that's more fake news. That's that they will, they will reject the validity of science, of, of, of journalism, of government leaders, whatever. So I personally, Am, am at a loss to know. And, and I've been at this for a long time, and perhaps the people in the room have some thoughts, is how do you push back in an environment where there's just so much negative stuff out there um, in a way that's helpful and hopefully not hurtful? Diana has her hand up. Diana. Diana. Uh, <laughs> um, I actually have a really great example for that. In my, in my city, um, there were a lot of car accidents because of um, because people were driving under the influence and just you know it wasn't it was something about um, those consequences that happened because of people's stupidity. So then what happened? It was like a community service and people uh, who were the cause of a car accident. They had uh, they went and they took care of people who were disabled because of the car accidents. So I think, so basically what was the purpose of it is to see what happens to people and what are the consequences of acting the way they did. So I think that would be a perfect example. We could do that. So if someone would be like, oh, I'm still gonna continue spreading hate speech, we'd be like, okay, then we will try to show you what will happen to you if someone would hate on you. So I think that's a really, I think, showing the consequences would be the best solution. Thanks, great and Aya has her hand up. I don't know yeah. if you can see the hands up, Larry. I can't, so go ahead. Thank you for helping on that. Yeah, go ahead, please. Um, I just wanted to say, um, I think the phrase, it takes a village to, to raise a child. I think that is um, the key to everything. If 
and the, if the community comes together. And for me, education is a very important thing. Um, here in Iceland, we have a special class that is called, roughly translated, life skills. So we, it is at least once a week and we learn something about communication or something. So I think that is something that we can implement um, in yeah, other countries. I think it is very important to have that uh, conversation every week about what is new and how people feel because people um, they say their emotions and something on the internet. So yeah, because some people don't have that support at home. So I think the school really needs to keep up. So uh, I think we've covered a lot of topics this morning. It's been a really great debate. I hope we're going to continue it outside or perhaps online. We've talked about online reputation, bullying. We've talked about the importance of empathy, of education. Um, I'm going to leave the last three minutes to Larry because Larry had great problems getting in. And I think his questions have been really waking us up, making us think about other things. Over to you, Larry, to finish off the session in the next two minutes. Well, the, the final point I want to make, and I, we referenced, I referenced this earlier, um, about youth leading the way, because sometimes parents are actually more of the problem than the young people. And one of the things that I'd like to hear from the young, and I know we only have a minute or two left, but from one of the panelists in the, in the room is what do you do if when parents are bad role models? It's very difficult for a child to counter their parents, but sometimes that is the problem. And at least here in this country, it's a big problem. Any thoughts on that? I know that's a hard one. <laughs> I have well, a raised hand and it's Diana. Yes. Um, well, uh, I, I actually, my parents are like that. And I, what I do is I am actually right now, I can't do much, but just educate myself. So I focus on my education. And as soon as I finish my education, I'm out, I'm out of the country and I will try to um, spread the awareness and, you know, teach the parents of what they should do it and what they shouldn't. Because for example, screen time, uh, you've probably heard of it. I think that's a pretty negative thing because once the screen time is off, the child will start will start using the device and it will be on the device for like more than 10 hours because I've experienced that. Um, so yeah, that would be for me. Well, one of the things that makes me optimistic is obviously you are on the verge of being an adult yourself. And if we have more young people like you entering adulthood, perhaps the next generation of young people are going to have fewer problems uh, than your generation does in terms of parental role models. So thank you for being a future great role model and maybe a present great role model. A any other comments uh, about, and just adults in general, not maybe not even your own parent, but how do young people lead? Because let's face it, uh, if you look at the world now and even historically, Young people are usually at the vanguard of great social movements. Thank uh, you, Larry. It, I'm afraid we have to close now. It's exactly 11. We will continue this conversation. Thank you. Goodbye to everyone.